Welcome back. In part one of this lesson, we covered the location and functions of the key tools in DesignCAD. Just like SOLIDWORKS, we should pick our units of measure before we get going. Selecting options, units of measure, will give us a drop down in which we can pick. Unitless is interesting in that we can draw it in drawing units and then have actual lengths assigned based on the units set in the document we import our file into. If it's set in inches, one drawing unit will become one inch. If it's set in millimeters, one drawing unit will become one millimeter. We'll go with millimeters as we usually do, but we don't have the luxury of an auto unit conversion like in SOLIDWORKS. So if we're drawing in millimeters in Design CAD, and we've got a line that's two and a half inches long, we'll have to type in 2.5 times 25.4. It will do that calculation for us, but it won't automatically convert units. Now we're ready to start doing some drawing. Let's start off by saving our file. Then let's get the line tool and draw a line. There's no visible origin preset for us to snap to in Design CAD, so we'll just click in a convenient place to set our first point. We'll get a green line leading from this point to the cursor. Previewing the line, we'll get if we click the mouse a second time to end the line. We can see that we're moving it freehand. Because we don't have driving dimensions available to us in Design CAD, we don't have the luxury of slapping together a rough sketch and then forcing it to size with dimensions. So, placing the entities freehand can be a bit of an issue. Just to keep things consistent, we'll draw the standard intro lesson tombstone top so we can see how the approach will change when using Design CAD. We'll make this line the line across the bottom of the backplate of the tombstone. It will be horizontal and 80 millimeters across. We've already set our first point, so we'll use a hotkey control to numerically set the second point relative to the first point. Let's press the apostrophe key to get a tool called point relative. We'll set the dx value to 80 and the dy value to zero. We want the relative to option set to last point. This ensures that the position of our new point is relative to our starting point. You may have noticed that one of the options was to set the point relative to the origin. In Design CAD, we can move our origin to where we want it. Let's do this now. At the top of the screen, select the drop down called point and open it. About halfway down, there is a command called origin. Select this. The cursor will change to a crosshair. Move the crosshair close to the left end of the line we've drawn and press the period key. The cursor will snap to this endpoint and disappear. Press the enter key to lock in the change. If we take our cursor and place it on that endpoint, we will notice that our X and Y value display in the menu at the top of our screen are now zero. If we activate our rulers, we can also see that this line is as zero in the Y axis and begins at zero on the X axis. Now we'll repeat the process we used to make this line to make the leftmost vertical side of the main box for our headstone. We can select either the line or the ortho line for this, as the line we're drawing will be parallel to one of the axes. We start by using the period key to snap to the left end of the horizontal line we made. We then use the apostrophe key to set a point relative with a dx of 0 and a dy of 60. If we want to double check our line length, we can press the U key and then the period key to snap to either end of the line we're checking. Like Measure in SOLIDWORKS, this will return a length value without inserting a dimension into the drawing. This is probably a good time to take a little side trip to talk about snapping in DesignCAD. It works very much in the same way, but it has to be manually triggered or at least manually enabled. At the left of the drawing window, between it and the drawing tools window, there is a toolbox with a bunch of yellow and red asterisks in it. This is the snapping menu. Normally, it's left toggled off. When it is off, the only snapping available is the endpoint snap that's activated by pressing the period key as described a little bit back. While this is pretty useful, there are times when you want to be able to snap to some other kind of entity or position, like we can in SOLIDWORKS. We don't use the top three options, but the others will feel quite familiar from SOLIDWORKS, if not as automatic. Each can be toggled on to activate it. They will work when you set a start or end point for your next drawing entity. All will preview where the snap is going to be placed with a little box. 
and all require that the cursor be quite close to the entity that's going to be snapped to for the snap function to become active. If you have your little box, it will snap if you click the mouse. These will also work if setting a handle, which will be covered a little later on. The snap tools will toggle back off again as soon as they are used. Gravity snap will snap to the center of a circle or arc. Line snap will snap to the nearest line, but is not locked to any position on the line until you click the mouse. Intersect will only snap to points where two lines intersect. Intersect 2 will also snap to an intersection, but instead of directly selecting the intersection point, the user can select the lines and DesignCAD will find their intersection point. Midpoint will snap to the middle of a line when the cursor is brought close enough to that point to activate the snapping function. Midpoint 2 will snap to the point exactly one half way between two points that are set with mouse clicks, regardless of whether those points are set in space or on entities. Center of gravity will snap to the point in a shape where the area within that shape on either side of an axis running through that point is equal. In a simple extrusion of this shape in homogeneous material, this would be the xy position of its center of gravity. Tangent snap will snap to a circle such that the incoming entity is tangent to that circle. Quadrant snap will snap to specific points on a circle located at 45 degree intervals, as opposed to 90 degree intervals of this kind of snap in SOLIDWORKS. And now back to our regularly scheduled programming. To complete our box, we've got a couple of options. The first is to simply use the method we've used earlier to add another 80 unit horizontal line and another 60 unit vertical line to turn our L into a box. Instead, we're going to use our parallel by distance tool to create the first line and then just use the parallel tool to create the second. Let's open the parallel by distance tool and set the value to 60. We'll then click on the horizontal line and then click again anywhere above it. A line will be drawn 60 units above the first line. For the right side vertical, we'll activate the parallel tool. Then we can click on the left side vertical and move the cursor until it's very close to the right end of either the top or bottom horizontal line. We can see that the rubber band version of the parallel line will move with our cursor. If we then use the period key to snap to the right end of one of our horizontal lines, the parallel line will be placed exactly at the horizontal distance from the left upright. An alternative method would have been to use the box tool to create the box as a single entity using the point relative control to set the dx and dy values at the same time. The difference in outcome would be that the box is a single entity, though this is easily rectified by using the break line command to split it into four separate line entities. To start to turn this into the headstone for our little tombstone sign, we'll need to round the top two corners. The tool for this is found under the trim tools in the main drawing toolbar. We'll select the fillet tool and adjust the radius to 20. We'll then select each of the lines that we want to fill it and we'll see our green rubber band preview. Click yes and the corner is filleted. We'll press F3 to activate the fillet tool once again and do the same for the other corner. You can see that we only had the constant radius fillet available. Getting a more complex shape of fillet would require reference lines, the use of a spline and a mirror action in design CAD. Since we don't have the ability to drag spline points or set tangent angles after the fact in Design CAD, this can be very tough and could even involve setting up an ellipse and tracing it. We won't bother with this exercise. Suffice it to say, getting multi-radius fillets in SOLIDWORKS is much easier. At this point, we have the back plate of our tombstone upright completed. We'll want to save it as a DXF. Let's start by pressing Ctrl W to make sure there are no unseen entities outside the range we're viewing. But we're going to run in a very minor difference between Design CAD and SOLIDWORKS. If we try File, Save As, like we would in SOLIDWORKS, our only file type options will be different versions of Design CAD. We'll have to look further down the File menu and find the Export command. In the drop down File Type menu of the toolbox that opens up, We'll need to select DXF. Once we designate a suitable folder and file name, we press the save button in the lower right corner and the drawing is exported as a DXF. I'll just quickly save the file and then turn you over to James to turn this backplate into a midplate. Thanks, Matea.
Now, to turn this into the mid plate, we'll need to add the tongue to the bottom and then add our cut in lettering. Let's start with the tongue. This will be pretty easy if we leverage our parallel by distance tool. We'll set the distance to 9.4 in the little text box that pops up. We then click the bottom line of our drawing and then once again on the side we want the parallel line to go on. In this case, it will be below that line. Ah! We got a line parallel to the entire bottom part of the headstone. We must have forgotten to break it up into separate lines. Not a problem. Select the bottom of the headstone and press Shift Backslash. Click on the line again to verify that only the horizontal gets selected. Now we'll get our parallel by distance tool and we'll type in another equation. This time our distance will be the width of the headstone minus the desired width of the tongue, all divided by 2. This will give us the gap between each side of the tongue and the outsides of the headstone. So, bracket 80 minus 60, close bracket, divided by 2. This yields a value of 10. We'll click on the right upright and then again inside it. A parallel vertical line will appear. We can then press F3 to repeat the step. We don't have to redo the calculation because the last value used will stay in the menu until we change it. Now we open up our Trim Two Lines tool and make sure Trim Shorter End is not enabled. We click on one of our new parallel vertical lines and then on the bottom most horizontal line, making sure we click on this line between the two uprights. If we click on the outside of our vertical, like in SOLIDWORKS, we will keep the side we clicked on, not the side we did not. F3 repeats the tool so we can do the same on the left. We now have our tongue, but we still have the vertical lines extending up into the mid part of our headstone. Let's head back to our trim tool menu and grab the trim between two lines tool. There is a very similar tool in SOLIDWORKS, but this one works in the opposite order. In SOLIDWORKS, you click on the two lines you want to trim between, and then click on the lines you want to trim. In DESIGNCAD, you click on the line you want to trim, and then click on each of the two lines you want to trim it from between. We've eliminated the line we didn't want over our tongue, but we've still got two vertical lines extending up into our part. Not good, but easy to fix. We can either get our Trim 1 Line or Trim 2 Lines tool and trim the excess. Or we can simply delete the lines and use Ortho Line and our period key snap to quickly draw them back into place. Since the second option is marginally faster, that's what we'll do. Now we've got our mid plate with tongue, but we still need a couple of chamfers to help it get into the groove on the base more easily. Just like in SOLIDWORKS, we can set distance to distance or distance angle. We'll set distance 1 to 1 and distance 2 to 2. Whichever line we click on first will become distance 1, so we'll do this step twice, each time selecting the bottom horizontal first. All that's left on this piece is the cut-in lettering on the bottom. Nick will take us through that. To put some lettering on this, we'll head back to our toolbar and select the text tool about two-thirds of the way down. A pop-up will appear. In the top text box, we type the text we want to insert. We can choose our font, and we can select True Type Font or Vector Font. Vector Font will give us a stick figure version of the font, so we don't want that. There are usual controls for the size, bold, and justification, then size and angle. Beside the Size option is an option to save in vector form. Since this part is going to be exported as a DXF for cutting, instead of printed to paper or exported as a graphic for engraving, we want this activated. This will give us the outline of the letters instead of a filled in font. When we've got everything selected, 
We click where we want to start our text and we'll get a stick figure preview. Note that if we move the mouse around, the word will pivot about this first point. If we click again, we'll lock it into place on that angle, but if we just press the enter key, the text will be inserted horizontally. We'll just press enter. Our text will appear as outline letters in that font we specified. Each closed contour in our font is a separate entity. Also, we don't have the ability to place the text on a line, so if we want to relocate it, we can select all of the text by drawing a selection box around it and then move it by dragging the blue dot with our mouse. Four-way arrow means we're in drag mode. We can also move it using the set handle technique, which will be covered later on. Julia will take us through moving this text to a different layer so we can give it a separate laser cutting command when we go to cut the part. Layers are a concept that goes back to Disney's Snow White. In an animated film, a huge number of drawings are shown at a rate of about 30 per second, with each one being slightly different than the one before. Prior to Snow White, each drawing would be reproduced from the previous one by tracing and hand painting, with only those parts of the drawing that are supposed to be in motion changing position ever so slightly. Snow White used a new technique where the background was painted on one plate. Then they drew a character or a foreground element on a clear glass plate and stacked it on top of the first one, and so on. This layer greatly sped up the process, as each layer can now be edited independently of the other layers, meaning only those elements that were in motion needed to be redrawn for each frame in the movie. It also looked much nicer as it gave a bit of a 3D effect to the visual. In hand drafting, see-through paper would be stacked and the lift from the back with different elements drawn on different sheets in the stack. For a building, you could look at the walls, the wiring, the piping, etc. Or just one or two of them simply being added or removing the right sheet from the stack. DesignCAD handles this problem with virtual layers. Each layer can be edited independently as well as being made visible or invisible or locked from editing. Things like the line type and color can be also applied to a whole layer at once. Luckily, DesignCAD has a very elegant and simple way of assigning entities to one layer or another. If you use RDWorks, you'll be familiar with it. Let's select our text and then click on one of the colors in our color menu other than black. We'll use red. Then we'll click on the A key in this menu to apply this to our selection. When we press escape, our lettering is now red. We can press the letter L or click Options, Layer Options, to activate our layer toolbox. In the pop-up, we can see that there is only one layer. It is set to visible, edible, etc. You can see it can be locked with a password if we need to share this file and want people to be able to edit some parts of the file but not others. Let's right click up in the top line of the part that looks like a spreadsheet. We'll get a pop up menu with separate layers by color down near the bottom. We'll click on that. We'll accept the warning that it can't be undone, and now we have two layers. Press OK to close our layer toolbox. So you can see if we've got parts of the drawing that we want to be able to edit or group select without bothering other parts of the drawing. We can group our elements by drawing them in different colors and then separate them out by using this trick. The quite complex airplane drawing seen here was done like that. Each type of line was drawn in a different color and then separated onto layers. Each layer was then separately edited to batch apply line types and thickness, saving a ton of time versus changing line types back and forth as the drawing was being done. SolidWorks doesn't use layers, but instead uses features to allow the user to separately edit elements at the same drawing. That's it for the middle piece. Let's export it as a DXF like we did for the back piece. The colors and layers will be carried over into the DXF. Had we left the font solid, it would not have been carried over. Thanks, Julia. So far, we've built the back plate and middle plate for our three piece headstone. These two pieces have been individually saved as DXF files. Now we need to make our front plate and the letters that will stick up from the mid plate. The front plate is effectively just as 5mm lip around the outside of the headstone, but it does not have a tongue, so deleting the tongue will be our first order of business. We'll box select the entire tongue as well as the short bottom horizontals on either side. 
When these entities all light up a pink purple, we'll press the delete key to remove them. We can now put in a new horizontal bottom line using our ortho line tool. We'll snap it to the bottoms of our two uprights using the period key. We'll press Ctrl W to fit and center the drawing, and we'll leave the bottom lettering in it for now so we can have a reference. The next thing we'll do is to set up a reference line for the text we're going to arc through the drawing. We'll use parallel by distance to create a horizontal line 30 millimeters up from the bottom of the part, and then use a midpoint snap and parallel from a line to add a vertical 10 millimeter tall line at the midpoint of this line. We can see that we'll want the endpoints from our letter arc in a bit from the edges. We'll use parallel by distance to set a pair of lines in 15 millimeters from either side of the part. We'll then use trim line to trim the horizontal to a length between these lines. We can see then select and delete the vertical reference lines as we no longer need them. In our text menu, we will select text along an arc. In the text box that pops up, we'll type our text in the top line, set the font to our desired font, and set it to a true type font and select save in vector format. We can adjust vertical scale if we want the text to be taller or shorter. The size of the font will be determined by the size of the arc that it is on, so we may need to try a couple of times to get things to look good. To set the font into position, we use three clicks, beginning, middle, and end. In our case, we'll set these points by snapping to the ends of the reference lines we had previously set up. That looks pretty good, so we'll delete our reference lines. And note that, unlike in SolidWorks, we don't get an error message when we delete an entity that had been used to position another entity. Next, we'll remove the red cut-in lettering that we needed for the middle piece. Again, we box select it and then press delete. Now we'll box select our new text, select a color, and hit A to apply the color. We then press the letter L to open the line options toolbox, and we'll repeat the process of separate layers by color. Now, we'll click on the black color select tool to make sure that we're drawing in black. We still have to make the outline that will create our lip. It's a good bet that our parallel by distance tool will do this nicely. Let's set it to 5 or 6 millimeters and start making the outline. You can see that we'll have to do it one segment at a time and that the straight lines crisscross at the bottom and will need to be trimmed. We can definitely do it that way, but lazy is good. So we'll do this a quicker way. We'll want to select all of the entities in the outline, but not the lettering. This is easy to do. We'll simply open our Layer Options toolbox again, and then select Layer 2 in the spreadsheet. It will turn blue. In the options below, we'll deselect the one that says Editable. The lock icon in the Layer Info above will toggle to Close. Press Apply, and then OK. Now we can box select the whole part, and only the outline will be selected. We can now click Edit, Selection Edit, Combine Lines to fuse all of the selected entities into a single entity. When we click anywhere on the outline, the entire outline is now selected. Now, if we repeat our Parallel by Distance command, we'll get a perfect inner outline in two clicks. We'll press L to reopen the Layer Options toolbox and unlock the second layer. The third and final piece of our tombstone upright is now ready for export. File, Export, Appropriate File Name and Folder, DXF File Type, and then Save. We can also save it as a design CAD file if we'd like. It's a very good idea to do so if you may need to modify the file in the future. Then again, if you forget, all is not lost. You can always open an empty design CAD drawing and import your DXFs to bring them back in for modification. That's all the skills we need for making our standard tombstone in design CAD. Nick and Julia will walk you through a couple of other techniques we'll need to do other common tasks, and then we'll wrap up this lesson. 
Since we've already saved our upright in recoverable form, we'll clear the screen by selecting all and then pressing delete. The first bonus technique we're going to look at is setting handles. This skill is critical to optimizing laser cut files as we do in later 2.1 lessons. Let's draw a box and center it on the screen. This one is 100 times 100 units, but it doesn't really matter. If we box select it or press Ctrl A, we'll get a blue dot with a blue ring around it or near the middle of the box. If we remember from earlier, we can use this dot to drag the selected entity around. This dot is called the handle. If we click on one of the lines, we'll see that our handle moves to the line where we clicked it. But if we wanted to set a handle at a specific spot, that could be pretty handy for moving something around and positioning it really accurately with snapping. Now, wouldn't it? Let's select our box again. Then we'll press Ctrl H to open our Set Handles tool. There's a drop down that allows different options of handle setting, but we'll just leave it at any location. We'll then use our period key to snap our cursor to the top right corner of the box. When we press Enter, the blue handle marker snaps to that location. We can now move the box by dragging it or moving it to the top corner. So, say we wanted to have two boxes set 10 millimeters horizontally apart. How could we approach this? To start, let's make a second box with a cut and paste, making sure we've placed the second box so that it doesn't overlap with the first one. We may need to zoom out to do this. Now, we can open our ortho line tool and period key snap to the top right corner of the left box. We'll set a point relative with a dx of 10 and press enter. We now have a horizontal line running 10 millimeters to the right of our part at the top right corner. We'll box select this entire left cube, extra line and all. Then we'll set a handle at the right end of the line. We can now drag the selection with our mouse if we want, but it's easier to place it with a snap if we press the M key to activate move mode. We can now move it without having to hold our mouse button down. We'll move it close to the upper left corner of the second cube and press the period key. It snaps in a position for us. We lock it in by pressing enter. Now we can select the joining line and delete it. And we're done. The final thing we're going to cover is using the array tool to create a pattern we can use for the interlocking part. Using ortho line in the point relative tool, we'll make three attached lines where the first line goes plus 30 in x, then another goes in negative 10 in y, and then the final line goes plus 30 in x from the bottom of the vertical line. Finally, we'll finish with another line that goes plus 10 vertically. We now box select everything. We set a handle at the left end of our first horizontal line. We'll open up the array tool. A toolbox pops up. We want five columns and one row, and we want to use the original as the first copy. We use our period key to snap to the top of our right side upward and press enter. A repeating zigzag pattern will pop up and run off the right side of our screen. Control W to bring everything into our view window. If we delete the uprights and lower horizontal on the right, we are left with a tab and a slot edge that begins and ends on a cut in and is 210 units long. There are three tabs and four slots and the depth of the slots is 10 millimeters. Well, that's it. We've covered all of the basic tools of Design CAD and how to apply them to the majority of drawings we do here in the Science Makers Lab. Design CAD doesn't have the cool 3D capabilities of SolidWorks, like the Cavity tool, but it's really quite good for drawing parts for laser cutting or for doing fantastic 2D layout drawings and it's much easier to just sit down and figure out how to use due to the super intuitive command names. Plus, with its heritage stemming from the days with the Pentnum 66 megahertz machine with 32 megabytes of RAM was a hot rod. It will run fast, stable, and smooth on just any modern computer. We'll show you a couple of specific Science Maker Lab applications for Design CAD in Lesson 2.1b and 2.1c. Then we'll leave the creating up to you. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to meeting you again in Lesson 2.1b.